Corth Cowl stands on the coast of Glamorganshire, midway between Cardiff and Swansea, essentially a Victorian town but surrounded by an ancient history. From the river Ogmore in the east, the dunes of Merthyr Mawr have revealed evidence of Stone Age man, while to the west of Porth Call, under the duned landscape of Kenfig, lie the ruins of a medieval town. The museum displays dinosaur footprints from 200 million years ago. Bronze Age folk live near here. Axe heads and arrowheads have been found in burial chambers near the Kenfig Pool, now the heart of a national nature reserve. Scare House, originally a Grange farm of Neath Abbey of the Cistercians, close to the village of Llandewi, the Nottage of today. Saxons farmed and traded here. The Vikings left their names, Tusker, Wick, Nash and Scare. They invaded in flat-bottomed craft, sailing inland along the creek to the hill, this depression to the east of the village. The stream passed close to Funanbaur. Then it went under this road. And down past the ancient standing stones into the wetlands and down to the wilderness, today a delightful park. Under the old dock, now filled in, and out to the sea near Porthcall Point. St. David, Dewi Sant himself, is said to have quenched his thirst at Fun on Dewi on his long pilgrimage from Llanilted Vaur to see a Benrul in the sixth century. The well of supposedly curative powers. And today, the well water still flows as sweetly as it ever did. As early as 1657, Nottage was a centre of nonconformity in Glamorgan, but centuries before that there was a Saxon church in Llandewi. The lanes around the village meander, all the more to harass any invader who broke through the outer ditches. The streets are deliberately crooked, and the cottages built end on to the road. The rural air of the village is epitomised in its cottages. Elm Cottage. and Top Farm Cottage. Nearby is Lacha Row. Apothecary Cottage. And the old barn, now the village butchers. Ashcott Villa, where once stood the wooden church of St. David. Many human remains were discovered here in Heola Capel when the railway was built in the last century. A cross still remains buried in the wall of the village green. The rose and crown faces the green still. Originally, two cottages, Rose Cottage and Crown Cottage. Nearby is a Welsh longhouse where the farmer and his family shared their home with their cattle. Nottage was essentially an agricultural village and still has an air of tranquility. It was dismissed as being a quiet cluster of farms and cottages. This stone lamb was once on the gable of the Lamb Inn, but now rests in the wall of Nottage Court. The tea mow of old. Nearby are tramway cottages.
and Nottage Court was a Grange farm of Margham Abbey, rebuilt in Elizabethan style by the Lucker family in 1570. Fanon Vaur is a well along the limestone strata and supplied fresh water to Nottage and later to the growing town of Port Cole. A mile away, the twin village of Newton is of Norman foundation and the squat church tower stands above the dunes as it has done since the 12th century. In 1819, the church of John the Baptist looked like this. Dormer window, blocked up porch and no lich gate. The lovely interior shows clearly that the chancel arch was once the east window. The pulpit, unique, wall-mounted, pre-Reformation, sharing the flagellation of Christ and the oak choir stalls. Nearby, the water is calm on Newton Bay. A port existed here in the 15th and 16th centuries. Villagers exported wheat, butter, sheep, wool, and knitted stockings across the channel to Devon and Somerset. In the churchyard are the graves of sailors whose lives were ended by the waters of the channel. Today, caravans and houses fringe the shore of Newton Bay. At one time, there was a solitary bathing house for the gentry. And the warehouse, later known as Old Red House, stood here. Long since gone, but it was on this point. Sanford's Well on Newton Green was the source of water for the village. It had healing qualities too, the fresh water of the well emptied uncannily as the salt water flowed into the bay and filled up again as the tide ebbed. And Die Viking ascends from its cool, clear depths. The maritime link is maintained. The Jolly Sailor in 1818 had a reputation for being the haunt of smugglers. The bar of the Jolly is filled with maritime memorabilia. <laughs> Across the green, the crown was important enough to have its own brewery, and the ancient Britain home of an early mutual benefit society. The village school built in 1846 to house 96 children. And the headmaster's house still adjoins it. The cottages of Newton preserve the peace of this seaside village, dismissed a century ago as a decayed bathing hamlet. Hope Chapel of 1827 stood next to the welcome to town. Now the inn has resorted to a row of charming cottages. And along Newton Nottage Road, the Globe Inn was built near a large pond which overflowed from the wine. Jennings Building dates from 1832 and is probably the oldest maritime industrial building in Wales. It was built as a warehouse for the horse drawn trams. The massive breakwater gave shelter to the ships sailing out of Porthcawl's new floating dock which was completed in 1867. The dufferin port Coal Railway started its journey here in 1825 in Spelter's dufferin and its six-hour journey took it down to the village of Nantefatlon, down to Nysteg. A small section of the track still remains in the car park there. and Commercial Street was the route of the tramway down to Moor Lane in Nottage.
and the last remaining section is here on the breakwater in Port Core. An old stone sleeper now decorates a gatepost in Moor Lane. A rusty rail remains. And in the roadway, a short length still lies embedded. Under this very spot, Great Western Railway dug a rail tunnel which existed until the 1960s. And at the end of the line was the heart of the maritime history of our town, Jennings Building. And this rusted sea anchor remains as a memorial. To Paul's call came John Brogdon from Sale in Manchester, his son James, and the family firm was responsible for the mighty breakwater. The inner harbour its locked gates in 1867. There was a shipyard. And by the 1880s, some 800 ships left here, carrying 227,000 tonnes of coal and ore, some as far as Valparaiso in South America. The colliers left the harbour at high tide, their holds filled with good Welsh coal. It came from these hoists on the North Quay. The paddle tug Thames assisted the skilful channel pilots who guided the ships out into the waters of the Bristol Channel, where the tidal rise is the second highest in the world. But the building of deep water harbours along the coast led to a decline in export by the 1880s. By 1906, this last ship left Port Cornwall Harbour. The lifeboat was then not quite so busy. The lookout tower The lighthouse, the old customs house. They had lost their main use, and the fishermen had the stone pier to themselves, watched over by the lighthouse, which is still gaslit. The massive breakwater still protects Sandy Bay. But by 1943, the inner harbour was filled in, the huge dock gates replaced by limestone walls. But the original dock entrance of the 1830s and 40s can still be traced along the east wall. The Glamorgan Holiday Home stands now where once were derelict buildings. They stood on the site of Colonel Knight's bathing hut the first building in Porth Call. This lovely cottage in Caroline Street, now Esplanade Avenue. That was built in the 1850s, as were Lyas Cottages nearby. The square became the heart of the town and the Knight Arms dates from the 1830s. The Pier Hotel built on the site of Pilots Row on the Esplanade. But in 1859, the National Lifeboat Institution opened a boathouse on the Esplanade. A new road was built to bring traffic from Red Hill into town. In 
New road today is older, cleaner, and somewhat busier. The old ship and castle changed its name to the lifeboat as a tribute to the many gallant crewmen since 1859. This is the Speedwell in 1887. Would the crew recognize its old home today? As the town developed, Victoria's name was commemorated. The inn in Victoria Street. John Street, virtually unrecognizable in the 1880s, has changed greatly. Victorian architecture, its oriel windows and its steeply gabled roofs still dominate the shops. But cars replace pedestrians. Well Street, the site of an old well, was completed over a hundred years ago. And then came the railway. A Great Western branch line from Pyle, and a station was built here in South Road at the top of Station Hill. By 1887, to commemorate the Queen's Jubilee, Brogdon's Esplanade was finished. At its western extremity, New House was replaced by Seabank House, in turn, House School, Hotel, Hydro, and today, the Seabank Hotel. John Brogdon's last home was here in the Esplanade Hotel. He died in 1907. His widow then lived in Victoria Avenue. And Lucy, their last daughter, lived here in Rose Cottage in Philadelphia Road and died in 1954. The family grave now restored lies under the northeast wall of the parish churchyard. Port's Hall School, built in 1933, replaced the old National School in Lyas Road, which was demolished, its site now occupied by Summerfield's store. Porth Hall had many private schools too, Moreland's at the end of New Road, the fifth form at work. Stonely College, whose drinking fountain is now incorporated into the shelter opposite the Seabank Hotel. Brogdon's original seawall could not hold back Porth Court's high tides, so a vertical wall was built. And in 1935, the lower promenade added. The pavilion an unconventional octagonal design was built in 1932 and still dominates the Esplanade today. Its floor used for dances and meetings. And its stage for concerts, opera, pantomime, and summer comedy. At the eastern end was Cozy Corner, cinema, concert hall and skating rink. The inner dock became a swimming pool and a huge boating lake. The rock pools on Town Bay catered for toddlers. At Rest Bay with its bathing huts was the place to experience the huge Atlantic waves. The war years of 39-45 are recorded in the museum in John Street. The RAF Stormy Down was an air gunnery school during those years. Today, the once busy aerodrome is Handley Page Harrow and Fairy Battle. Here's a collection of huts and hangars. This was the busy runway. And the buildings are still peopled with the ghosts of a wartime generation who trained here 50 years ago. The 
Memories of the war years, too, were recalled in a poignant manner by the old soldiers of the 49th Reconnaissance Regiment, formed here in 1942. The band of the 4th Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Wales leads a parade along the promenade. Legion banners proudly held aloft at the head of a long column of blue blazer be metal veterans of a war which ended 50 years ago. And did a wartime jeep ever carry such a glamorously attired lady as the town mayor of Fort Corn? The last trains left the town in 1964, but this is not just in the 1950s and the days of steam, when great western locomotives pulled excursion trains into the growing resort through tunnel and cutting down to the sea. This signal box stood on Station Hill, guarding the town's level crossing. and at the terminus. Crowds poured out Port Gaul Station. And traffic moved once again on Station Hill. At Nottage Halt, the train rumbles through the station. Today, only the platform remains, and the track bed is clearly visible. Cuckoo Bridge in Moor Lane is still there, but sadly the trains have gone, and so too has the signal box. In the old station yard, Harlequin Antiques stands alone, once a busy ship's chandlery store. And across the inner harbour, the miniature Coley Beach Railway ran from the pierhead to Coley Beach. And the fair was Thrubbins. In Nottage, vintage cars drive through the narrow streets of Riley, a sidecar, a mile a thousand. They compete with tractors going down to the barns on the village green. Just round the corner by Groys Cottage. An Austin 7 puffs up Nottage Hill. And the 40 acre site still unbuilt on. But today, new houses fill the fields of this once largely agricultural community. Guarding the welfare of our town was this magnificent fire engine of the 1930s. The fire station then stood behind Mary Street. Later was moved to land at the north end of the old dock. Where those brass helmets of 60 years ago. Fourth Call can never forget its maritime past. The sea is always there, sometimes in a cruel mood. The town remembers especially 
the night of the 23rd of April, 1947, when 39 crew of the Tampa perished as it ate brave men of the Mumbles lifeboat on the rocks at Scare Point. Today's Port Call inshore lifeboat launches speedily to the rescue of a holidaymaker, unaware of the dangers of the Channel waters. John Street has changed since the 1880s. Today it bustles with shoppers, and this curious lad is testing the sharpness of the butcher's cleaver, and also his mother's impatience. Traffic has now gone. And John Street is pedestrianised. The old police station of 1881 is now home to the tourist centre, the art club, the museum. And these red deer antlers predate the birth of Christ by 10,000 years. A common gull. And this 1920s dress, still elegant. And relics of the beaker folk, evidence of a much older civilization on the dunes. The insignia granted by the College of Arms, the mayoral badge of office. Along John Street is the original shop front of Davis Cloth Hall. It stands alongside the old Colosseum Cinema with its decorated facade. The welcoming interior of the outfitters has not changed, thankfully. And opposite is the elegant clock shop. Away from the bustle of John Street, life goes on in the villages, which existed long before Port Corps came into being in the last century. Farming is now mechanised. But agricultural implements are still repaired here in Nottage Forge. The little cobbler's shop in South Road looks as it always must have done. The lovely bays of our town have hardly changed. The long sand of Rest Bay. Sandy Bay. And the Balmoral calls at the breakwater as did the Cambria some 80 years ago. The glorious sweep of the town bay remains unchanged, but now greatly enhanced by a beautiful new promenade. A seaside ice cream still retains its old attractions. On Sandy Bay, a little boy swims ashore under the watchful eye of a lifeguard. The water chute dominates the shoreline. And as dusk falls, the magic of the fairground comes vibrantly alive as it has done every summer since the 1920s. The wheels revolve. The dodging cars. Gerald planes. And always the elegant carousel. The last seagoing paddle steamer in the world, the Waverley, 
sails into Porthcawl Harbour on its last voyage in this glorious summer of 1995. Picture of Edwardian elegance. sails away down the channel, following the route taken by mariners over the last 170 years, ever since the tramway came to Pult Cowl, then an unknown little bay in the parish of Newton Nottage, here in Glebobanshire. Thank you.